Good evening, Parker Bible Church. Good to uh, be with you again this evening. Hope everyone is doing well. And uh, we get to see a few of you along the way, uh, and it's always good. Just wanted to uh, let you know, uh, according to the, the pastor's uh, group that gets a uh, response from our governor, apparently what is going to be happening as far as churches go is that uh, we're going to have to continue doing what we're doing through May, and, and I think uh, around the 1st of June is what they're targeting for perhaps being able to have additional people uh, in church gatherings, but uh, we'll keep you posted on that and let you know. In the meantime, of course, uh, this is what we're doing. We're doing the best we can to try to have some good teaching and uh, make sure that uh, you have some things that you can uh, do to grow spiritually. And of course, we're focusing on the nine marks of a healthy church. We want to be a healthy church, of course. And uh, so we're looking at these qualities, and we'll be doing that for several weeks. Next Thursday night, Pastor Michael will be continuing our emphasis on the Puritans as we look at the life of Richard Baxter, and that'll be a, a good time as well. So I encourage you to tune in for next Thursday night. Well, let's begin with prayer, and then we'll focus on the mark of a biblical theology this evening. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to be in your word tonight. And Lord, we thank you for uh, the church that you have allowed us to be a part of. And Lord, we know that it's all by your grace. We thank you for the salvation we have in Christ. And Lord, we thank you for a spiritual family that we can have encouragement from. And even though right now we're separated from one another to a degree, uh, Lord, we, it's just good to know we have others praying and uh, that we still are a family, though we're a part. And Lord, we thank you that uh, you've given us your word. You've given us the instruction that you have for us and how to be a, a church that's pleasing to you. And so, Lord, we, we desire that. We want to be a healthy church, and we, think, we believe we are, but uh, we're grateful to you for that. And Lord, we pray that we would be clear as to what you have to say about your church and how we can be a church that's pleasing in your sight. And Lord, once again tonight as we look at uh, this uh, second mark, that we would know what uh, this is all about and, and how we need to make sure that uh, we have a biblical theology in everything that we do. And Lord, we ask tonight once again that you would Help us as we go through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, to introduce our topic tonight, let me just ask you to turn with me in your Bible to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. I know we recently went through 1 John, but I want to come back to this verse tonight. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Here's what it says. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. Now, what do the words, shall be like him, mean? Well, as evangelical Christians, we should know that this is referring to the fact that at the end of time, when Christ returns, his church will reflect his holy character apart from the distortion of the presence and the influence of sin. If you study the entire third chapter of 1 John, you will see that delineated. But if you happen to be sitting in a Mormon church, you will hear it taught very differently. The Mormons believe that this verse teaches that we will become gods. In fact, they believe that those who become gods will each have his own planet. Now, Mark Dever points to this illustration, but what is the primary difference between those two interpretations. 
The difference is that one is based on the entire teaching of Scripture and the other is not. It is very easy to come to a wrong conclusion anytime you pull a particular verse out of its context. Here's another example. Turn with me for a moment to 1 Corinthians 15, 29. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. We also went through 1 Corinthians recently, and we saw this verse. Here's what it says. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Some teach from this passage a type of proxy baptism to aid those who have already died. This heresy was first taught by the false teacher Marcion in the first century, who also taught that the Old Testament was not divinely inspired. This same doctrine has been taught by the Mormon church, and as you may know, you are not permitted into a Mormon temple unless you have proven yourself to be a good Mormon. But one of the things that goes on in those Mormon temples is baptism on behalf of the dead. Mormons believe that you can go back through history and get baptized for all your dead ancestors. This is one of the main reasons why Mormons are into genealogy so much. If you go to Ancestry.com and pay to have your family background researched, you are really supporting the Mormon church. It is based on the careful records they have kept. And some of the best and most accurate genealogical records are held by the Mormon church, but this is the main reason why. They want to be able to go back and get baptized for all their ancestors. In fact, I heard a pastor say one time that he had heard a Mormon woman say, I have saved more people than Jesus Christ because I have been baptized for many thousands of people. They will often pick out well-known figures in history, such as Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great or Napoleon, and be baptized for them. And all that is based on a faulty understanding of this one verse. But again, it is pulling one verse out of context. And if you take into consideration everything else that Paul taught and everything in the New Testament and the Old Testament, you can say with confidence that Paul is not teaching some kind of proxy baptism to save those who have already died. The Bible does not teach baptismal regeneration. And I have delivered an entire sermon on this one verse, but we won't take the time to go through that tonight. I just wanted to give this as an example of what often happens when we fail to have a biblical theology. Now, last week, I said that the first mark of a healthy church is expository preaching. We need to know what God's Word has to say. We need to understand what the original authors of Scripture meant when they wrote these divinely inspired words. And we need to understand them in their full and proper context. But that has to do with how we are taught, while tonight's topic really has to do with what is taught. And granted, the method of expository preaching leads to the true meaning, but what we're dealing with tonight (coughs) is making sure we have a biblical theology that takes into consideration the entirety 
of the Bible's teaching on any given doctrine. This, of course, gets into the area of systematic theology. But it is critical that if we're going to be a healthy church, that we embrace sound doctrine, that we have a biblical theology, a theology that is based upon the whole counsel of God. People often say something to the effect of, well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere about it. That's baloney. It matters very much what you believe. Joel Osteen has said, people don't want to hear about doctrine. They just want to know how to live their lives. And I say, if you don't know biblical doctrine, then you can't know how God wants you to live your life. Now, the New Testament has a lot to say about sound doctrine. For example, Paul uses the word sound a number of times in the pastoral epistles to Timothy and Titus. The Greek word is hugiano. It means to be sound or to be healthy. The root word carries with it a medical concept of good health. Soundness means whole or healthy. It later became that which referred to something accurate, reliable, or faithful. So teaching that is biblically sound is teaching that is faithful to the revelation of the entire Word of God. It reliably and accurately portrays the original intent of the Holy Spirit, who is the ultimate author of Scripture. Turn with me for a moment to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy 1. We're going to look here for a minute or two in the pastoral epistles. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And look with me at verses 10 and 11. Actually, we need to go back to verse 8 to get the flow of thought. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, <clears throat> for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is, notice, contrary to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Paul had been taught by Christ himself in the Arabian desert. He had received the revelation of the true gospel directly from Christ. And here he's reminding Timothy that any teaching that is not according to this gospel is not sound teaching. It is heretical and false. Go to chapter 4 for a moment. Look with me at verse 6 in chapter 4. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of sound doctrine which you have been following. Again, a reference to sound doctrine. Now, in that chapter, Paul is talking about some things that make up false teaching. In verse 1, he wrote, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. He then goes into the specifics of that, but he's telling Timothy here to make sure he points out all these errors and then leads the people back to the truth. 
Go over to chapter 6. You're right there in 1 Timothy. Go to chapter 6 and look with me at verse 3. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. Sound words are those that are in agreement with the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are words that conform to godliness. If it leads to something else, it's not sound doctrine. Let's go to the second epistle of Timothy. Look with me at 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. He tells Timothy, retain the standard of sound words which you heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Paul knew these were sound words because he had received them directly from the Lord himself. Paul knew he was at this point divinely inspired to write these words of Scripture and he tells Timothy here that this is the standard that must be retained. The King, King James has the word form there. The ESV and the NIV have the word pattern. In other words, this is the plumb line. Everything must be according to the revelation of the Lord. Anything that departs from that is error. And by the way, note the word retain in that verse. Uh, it's a very interesting word. Literally, it refers to the impression a horse's hoof makes in the grounds. It literally means to engrave. So when Paul said, retain the standard of sound words, he was really saying to have God's standards indelibly engraved on your heart and mind in such a way that it makes a difference in how you live. When the pressure comes to conform to the ways of the world, this engraved standard provides a counter pressure that enables you to stand firm to God's truth. Now, while we're in 2 Timothy 1, look at verse 14. He says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Circle the word guard there. Note, first of all, this is something you are to be actively doing. You don't do it totally on your own because... You do it through the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. But this is a command. This is an imperative. Therefore, it assumes that you might do it or you might not do it. You have to decide to do it, and you have to be committed to doing it. You have to decide you're going to guard that treasure of sound words the treasure that has been entrusted to you is the standard of sound words, the Scripture. But you have to guard that, and you have to make sure that no one comes along and steals it away from you. You have to guard against the deceit of your own sinful hearts. You have to guard against the attacks of Satan as he attempts to get you to embrace lies or half-truths. You have to guard against humanistic philosophies that can infiltrate the church and distort God's truth. But whatever you do, Paul says, guard this treasure. Guard this treasure. Don't let anyone steal it from you. It is something that God himself has given to us, and we must make sure it is not stolen away in any way. You know, I put on our church sign one time, the greatest thief is the one who would steal from you 
the truth, the truth. And it comes through the subtlety many times of popular psychology or the seemingly innocent methodologies of church growth pragmatism. It doesn't always come in the form of outright heresy. It comes in disguised as an angel of light. But we must be diligent to guard the truth, guard the treasure of God's word. We'll go on over to chapter 4 and look with me at verse 3, 2 Timothy 4, 3. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. There's going to come a time when people won't endure sound doctrine anymore. Paul predicts there's coming a day. I certainly believe that we see it in our own time where people will no longer put up with the teaching of doctrine. They will want teaching that is in accordance to their own sinful fleshly desires. They won't want to hear what God has actually said, but they will want to reinterpret the Scripture to make it say what they want it to say. Folks, that is exactly what we're seeing today with the new hermeneutic and the new homiletic. It is exactly what we see in the pragmatic seeker churches of our day and time. It is what we... saw in the emerging church, which has really almost kind of gone by the wayside. It is what we see in the liberal theology of mainline denominations. One pastor wrote, every church has the itchy ear syndrome. The average church member cares more about tact than they do truth. Diplomacy is more important than doctrine. Being polite is more important than being profound. And we see many examples of this tendency in the church today, but it really all boils down to a departure from sound doctrine or sometimes even no emphasis on sound doctrine. And then by the time we reach the stage of the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, the departure has gone so far that the church then is filled with those who are not even born again. It goes all the way to that extent. I'm sure you have heard of the solas of the Reformation. Well, someone has come up with the solas of the modern church. Carrie Stevens posted these on her Facebook page. The first one is sola cultura. Culture defines biblical preaching. Then there is sola successa. Numerical success determines truth. Then there's sola entertaina. Louder is better, and doctrine must go. Then there's sola mio, meet my needs. And there's sola emotionala, emote dudes and dudettes. And then finally, there's sola stupida, Thinking is not allowed. No creeds, no confessions, no doctrinal hymns, no historical references. How different these are than the solas of the Reformation. On the issue of meeting people's needs, Pastor James Merritt once said, the Bible was not written primarily to address felt needs, It was written to address unfelt needs. He tells preachers, just preach the book 
And if you do, you will not only meet every felt need, but you will uncover needs they didn't know they had. He adds, it's not my job to make the message acceptable, but to make the truth available. That's our responsibility here. We've got to have a biblical theology. Well, Paul also wrote to Titus with similar concerns. So turn with me over to Titus chapter 1. These are right next to one another, of course. In Titus 1.9, he told Titus that as he appoints elders in every city in Crete, that he must choose those who hold fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. The concept of holding fast is like that of a bulldog who clamps down on something and will not let go. But if you're going to be a New Testament elder, you have to be grounded in biblical theology. And you have to hang on to it no matter what anybody else in this world does. You've got to be like that bulldog and clamp down on it and not let go. This is why a prospective elder must be knowledgeable in God's Word. You have to know the Word well enough that you can teach it and that you can use it to contradict those who may try to refute it. So again, here we see the emphasis on sound doctrine. And listen, appointing an elder should not be that of just voting in the most popular guys in the congregation. You know that. It's not that of just finding someone who's successful in business. No, it is finding someone who has a good grasp on Scripture and is sound doctrinally so they can help protect the flock from error. Drop down to verse 13. This testimony is true. For this cause, reprove them severely that they may be noticed sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. The ones Titus is told to reprove severely are the false teachers that have emerged in the church. Verses 10 and 11 tell us that they are destructive parasites that are not only vain talkers and deceivers, but they upset whole families teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. God's word is truth, so we need to reprove and rebuke anyone who would turn away from the truth of it. In Paul's day, the temptation was to turn from the truth of Scripture to Jewish myths and traditions. But in our day, it may be that of turning to popular psychology or humanistic relativism. In our day, it might be turning to postmodern philosophies, but it's the very same thing. Anybody who turns away from the truth of God's Word to anything else is in error and in great spiritual danger. Go to chapter 2 and look at verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for what? Sound doctrine. What is it that preachers are are supposed to preach? The things that are fitting for sound doctrine. Preachers are to proclaim that which God himself has revealed to us in his holy word. We must make sure that what we are teaching is that which conforms to the truth that God himself has revealed to us. 
And the process involved in expository preaching will help to ensure that. But beyond that, we must be good theologians. We must be diligent to understand the entirety of Scripture and to do the hard work of pulling together all the Bible's teaching on any particular doctrine. Now, of course, some doctrines are more critical than others. All teaching from Scripture is equally important on one sense because it is all part of the revelation of God. However, there are some doctrines that are more essential as far as salvation goes. There are some doctrines that we would call the major doctrines of the faith. And there are others that we would probably call minor doctrines. For example, what you believe about the rapture is probably not as important as what you believe about the doctrine of justification. And of course, you've probably heard the old adage, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, diversity, in all things, charity. And that's probably a good saying. But the problem comes as some Christians put different things in the essentials category. Really, every church has to make a determination of what the essentials are and what the non-essentials are. And we have done that here at Parker Bible Church. We have a document called Essential Doctrines at Parker Bible Church. That is a document that we use on the website. It's one we use in the orientation class and generally to let people know what we believe. It includes what we consider to be the most important doctrines that we should all agree on. But we have another document called What We Believe and Teach at Parker Bible Church, and this document contains some minor doctrines as well, but things that we want all of our teachers to be together on, all our leaders to be together on. We also have three position papers that have been put together to deal with issues that have caused at certain points some kind of confusion or division and needed to be clarified to avoid those kind of things in the future. Most people never see those because they deal with non-essentials, but they're helpful at times when these issues come up and all of our teachers and all of our church leaders have them and have agreed to them. And the reason for this is that even though these issues are not critical as far as salvation or sanctification, they are helpful in maintaining unity and keeping us all on the same page doctrinally. Now, having said all that, I want to hasten to point out that a church that is committed to sound doctrine will be one that is committed to teaching the whole counsel of God. It is one that will not avoid certain doctrines in certain Bible passages because they are controversial or difficult to interpret. A church that is committed to having a biblical theology is one that will teach those truths that are often neglected or ignored by others. As Mark Dever puts it, to our eyes, certain doctrines may look difficult or even divisive, yet we can trust that God has included them in his word because they are foundational for understanding his work in salvation. He goes on and says, the Holy Spirit is no fool if he has revealed something in his book for all the world to read. Churches should not think of themselves as so wise that they do better to avoid certain subjects. Now certainly, pastors and teachers need to exercise discretion in how these things are taught. They should 
use pastoral wisdom and care in the teaching of some things, and all things should be done in love. But if we want our churches to be healthy, then we have to be grounded in biblical theology. And that means we have to teach everything that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us in Scripture. We must come to terms with the teaching of the entire Bible. We can't avoid certain doctrines. For example, we can't avoid the doctrine of election just because we think it might be controversial. That doctrine is clearly taught in Scripture. So we can't act like it's not there or that it is too confusing or too complex. The same, of course, can be said of the doctrine of the Trinity or the doctrine of the Incarnation or a number of other doctrines that are difficult for us to understand in our human finitude. But we must embrace these truths even when we can't fully comprehend them. And we must assume the perspicuity or clarity of Scripture. That is the belief that God intends for us to understand it. I mean, think about it. Why would God reveal something to us that we cannot understand? With the revelation comes the assumption that it is something we can understand. Of course, we might have to study it thoroughly, but we can understand it properly. But we can't afford to ignore or neglect difficult or controversial passages because all scripture is inspired by God and all of it is profitable for teaching and for reproof for correction and for training in righteousness some minor doctrines have to be clarified and we ultimately have to take a position on them because they have the potential to divide churches and to negatively impact fellowship among believers. But faithfulness to Scripture demands that we speak out on these issues and explain what the Bible has to say about them. When the Bible isn't clear on something, we should admit that and not be dogmatic but when the Bible does address something, we can't ignore it because it might be controversial. Now, all of the doctrines given in Scripture are important. But perhaps the most important of all are those doctrines that teach us the nature and character of God himself. The Bible is clear, for example, that God is the creator of all things. No, no a doubt at all about that. The Bible uh, tells us and is clear on the fact that God sovereignly controls everything in this universe. And as Mark Dever puts it, when those confessing Christ resist the idea of God's sovereignty in creation or salvation, they're really playing with pious paganism. Now, I don't know if you've thought about it that way, but it's really true. And surely we will have difficulty understanding the full ramifications of God's sovereignty and our election and our salvation, but we must embrace that because the Bible teaches it. And to deny the perfect omniscience of God May, may lead someone into open theism where they conclude that God does not know the future and that he has to wait to see what we are going to do. But that is not what the Bible declares. The Bible declares that God knows everything, past, present, and future, even though he allows man some measure of what we would call freedom. And of course, because we are finite and he is infinite, 
it is sometimes very difficult to pull these things together in our own minds. But we must go on not what we can reason, but what he has revealed. And just because we struggle to understand something does not mean it is any less true. So we must stick with his revelation, even when we can't fully understand it. And we must trust that he, in his infinite wisdom, has communicated to us what we need to know. And the rest of it, we won't understand until we are made like him. Let's pray together. Father, we pray tonight that you would help us as a church, that we would, in fact, have a biblical theology, that we would be committed to the whole counsel of your word. And Lord, that we would be those who know your word and know how to bring various passages together in such a way that we understand the entirety of your teaching and that we are truly biblical in everything we teach because, Lord, we want to be pleasing to you. And, Lord, we thank you for the treasure that you've given to us of your word. Help us to be good stewards of it. Help us to be faithful proclaimers of it. And help us to be a church that embraces nothing but your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope you have a good week. God bless you.